All right. Um, welcome to this uh, short workshop on finding out how to Dune around with crypto data. And if you're not familiar with Dune, um, that might be a bit confusing, but what we're gonna teach you today is data in Web3 is public by default. Um, public by default is most likely a feature, not always a bug. Um, Web3 data really levels the playing field and open data leads to better system-wide outcomes. Um, so first of all, Dune is a data analytics platform. We basically index uh, Ethereum and I think seven other EVM chains and Bitcoin and Solana. Um, but that's not, not the point today. Um, we're going to talk about Web3 data more broadly, but um, all of our researchers here are using Dune today. But you can do this on any other platform as well. Um, so what is so special about Web3 data um, is that it's open. And if we look on the flip side of this, um, data traditionally in businesses has always been locked. There's no way you can analyze what is happening on eBay or what is happening on Amazon. And if I'm an employee of eBay, I cannot look at yeah, what, what the other companies are doing. Um, and that's very sad because we can learn a lot from data um, in the world in general. Um, if there's publicly, if there's data sets that are broadly aggregated, they mostly pay for access. So all of you guys are probably familiar with Bloomberg or Statista where you're like, yeah, you, like you gotta pay me like $60,000 a year to like even access this data. And that's not very fun. So in Web3, um, or like, and one final thing about this is also like, if the data actually gets published, it's like in quarterly reports. Like we're basically like, everything happens at the speed of light. Um, the Silicon Valley blank got blown up in a weekend and we are like, yeah, quarterly reporting is like, that's the, that's the speed of uh, reporting we should have in the 21st century. Um, not very great. So in crypto on the other hand, there's literally this website, which is called transactionstreet.com, in which you can see transactions uh, flying over the blockchain in real time. Um, so very exciting and all publicly openly available. So if you look on the left here, um, you can kind of see the different, um, yeah, it, it looks like houses going out, but that's really where the transactions are going in. So it's like a bit inverted, but that's not the point here. Um, the point of this is um, everything is live, everything is accessible and everything is public. Um, and why is that all the case? Um, because we're all using this shared public backend, which are EVM chains or Bitcoin or uh, Solana. Um, anyone can analyze it. So this is what Hildobi and uh, Denning are gonna go into in a bit. And it's real time, it's flexible, and it's collaborative. So um, not only can I work on this data alone, but rather I can team up with these guys and our whole community basically teams up on a, on a daily manner and they make sense of this data together. Um, so yeah, instead of getting quarterly reports every three months, like quarterly, <laughs> um, and in a, in a PDF where like we don't even know what's going on, um, we now have uh, real-time financial statements on, on Dune or on any other uh, Web3 data website and this is um, from MakerDAO, and this is basically their uh, profit and loss statement, um, I think, of the last year. So with that, um, who has, like, the wonderful thing about this Web3 data is um, that anyone in this room basically has the same access as Vitalik himself does to this data, because it's all public, out in the open, so it really levels the playing field. And with that, I think I'm gonna hand off to Hildobi, who's one of the researchers on Dune, or, or one of the users of Dune, and uh, he's done a lot of crazy research. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Hildobi. I work at uh, Dragonfly, venture capital firm. And I actually got this job by first freelancing on uh, this Dune thing. So uh, I, I want to showcase how there's kind of different kinds of users Dune caters to. And the first and foremost is probably the biggest user. It's just the guy who wants to view dashboards. And there's already a lot of dashboards available on Dune. Uh, if you just search for stuff, uh, you'll find stuff that's already out there for NFT, DEXs. These are just random high-level charts, but I think they're pretty, they're pretty interesting. And the cool thing is, the way I started building on it is by looking at what other people built and then forking their queries and basing it off there. Uh, that's also how I learned SQL and, and how it all worked. And this is what like, the collaborative aspect kind of a boxer touched on, uh, I think is 
heavily under leveraged. Uh, basically, there's already this ton of work that is already out there, and you can base it on this and build on top of it. And uh, yeah, then you can also use um, something which is called a Spellbook, that is a Dune product where it's basically a GitHub repo where uh, anyone can contribute and build the backend of Dune of, of all these tables that are available. So some, some of those are the high level, like NFT tables, Dex tables, Gitcoin, I don't know. I put some random stuff where those are like two sectors, then you, you'll have uh, some community members contributing and creating Gitcoin tables so people, anyone can look into those. And then there's also like Optimism team who is uh, putting available their whole um, CSV of like who was eligible for their airdrop so that anyone can actually look into it and, and analyze the data. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, and it also abstracts a lot of the work away for most users where if you want to look at NFT trades, uh, if you want to do it from raw tables, that would be kind of hell because uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. But here you can just look at NFT or trades and then you got all this work already done and you can look into the actual data analysis part. Uh, so it kind of splits the data engineering from the data analysis. Um, I kind of like doing both. I also think there's a lot of interesting stuff in the engineering parts because the data analysis is only as good as your understanding as well as what's on the back end. But you don't necessarily need this if the backend is built well. And I think that's the case for, uh, for Dune, which has a growing level of, of data sets that uh, at this point is probably one of the better uh, amount of free data sets that you can use uh, all around. So uh, I actually hacked on something over the weekend, which is the MEV trades, which is the big topic this weekend, I feel. So I thought it was pretty relevant. And I wanted to show how I could leverage Dune to just show to look into some stats. Uh, everyone's building on stuff, but few are actually looking into the stats, and I think that's unfortunate. So I wanted to actually create a data set of all the um, sandwich trades on Dune, and I defined those with a few heuristics that I'm just going to quickly explain so you, it makes sense. But basically, here I'm joining the dex.trades table on itself, checking that in the same block. So here I'm looking at block time because it basically means to say block, but don't worry about it. Uh, that it's a different transaction, that they happen in, uh, the first one happened before the second one, that it was the same pool, that it was uh, either submitted by the same person or that the taker of the trade is the same person, uh, that the token sold in the first transaction was the token bought in the second one, uh, and vice versa. And also, uh, this is a heuristic to make sure that like, sometimes they won't sell the exact amount they bought during the sandwich, so there's kind of a like, buffer of 0 0.9 to 1.1, so 10% kind of buffer uh, both ways. Um, and I also want to make sure that, well, this isn't necessary, necessary, but basically I'm looking at, is it profitable of a trade? Uh, I could look at also unprofitable by just commenting this out. And then I also checked that there was actually a, transaction, a trade or two, uh, at least one trade that uh, was sandwiched in between. So that is fairly simple heuristics that I want to put out there in like, on Spellbook, and I'm working on like having Spellbook uh, data on this. And here are like a few charts I looked into, and I think uh, just want to show like the power of how Dune can use can be used to like leverage uh, those kind of topics that I feel like heavy, are heavily discussed, but don't necessarily have a lot of data backing it. And uh, of course, there's a lot of data websites that focus on it, but I've, it probably is catering a lot to protocol builders and, and more people who are deep into it. Uh, I kind of want to make sure this data is also accessed and, and shown to more uh, normies. I don't know how you call them. Uh, other users. Um, so here are like some high level, and you can see the share of gas, uh, how it's been spiking lately, the number of front run transactions. So if you want to look at the sandwich trades, it's actually times two because there's the front run and the back run. Um, and then this is also interesting, I think, is the average number of transactions in a block that are between the front run and the back run. Uh, you, sh you can see how. This is around when uh, Flashbots launched, and this is basically, it launched in January 2021, and it took a f like f a few months to get adoption. But before, it was a lot of uh, kind of guesswork. Uh, there, was, there was a bit of everything, but there was a lot of people trying to optimize with gas, to MEV with gas and like optimize. So it means you weren't actually bundling exactly in, uh, in between the trades, but could be you know, somewhere else in the block as long as it was in between somewhere. So that's where you can see the flashbots. Like now, there's a lot of lot fewer transactions being sandwiched, uh, and these are like transactions, not just trades. So, just just so you know. And now also, you can see the number of blocks uh, on Ethereum with MEV is actually spiking a lot. 
uh, and you can attribute it to, to a lot of things, but uh, I think it's just the, 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 the space moving towards optimization and more optimized state. Um, yeah, and I actually want to leave this on to uh, friend Danning, who's uh, now working at Flashbots. <clears throat> All right, cool. Yeah, I actually want to build on top of what uh, Dobby was talking about, MEV. So, like, first of all, we need to ex explain what is MEV <laughs> to people. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so, like, a very simple scenario, say you're trading on a DEX, like Uniswap, and you say, I'm a user, I'm coming in, I want to trade uh, USDC for Ethereum, and then you submit your transaction through a public RPC, and basically your transaction get broadcasted to all the people who are looking at the public mempool, like basically transaction pending pool. Basically the other charts that um, Boxer showed where everyone's like lining up for the bus. And then usually the mechanism is that like your, your position in the line is decided, uh, decided by your gas price. That's basically the whole gas auction design of Ethereum as a layer one. Um, but then there's are, there are people who have privileged uh, knowledge. For example, if they are like looking at the public mempool, um, which is like what we cannot do as a normal user if we're not running a node or we're like checking the node. Um, they will be like, okay, so there is a fat trade that's like trading a meme coin where the liquidity distribution is very, how to say, um, spiky. And then like I can submit my trade before it and then like maybe back run uh, after it. And in this case, I'll be like, I'm gonna catch that transaction. Be before POS, it's gonna be like, I'm gonna try to um, raise my gas price and then try to put my trade um, exactly in the position I want, and so to make some arbitrage. And that's uh, like the biggest uh, bad thing is um, it will cause the ga gas congestion for the Ethereum network. And then after POS, and then now uh, it's all um, changed to another sort of like a MEV supply chain thing. It's basically um, now there's a, this row called builder. They're like compiling all the bundles they receive. Um, the searchers are sending the bundles basically who are the, those people who are looking at the transaction pool and trying to make a you know, profitable arbitrage. Um, they're gonna be like, oh, now I, I wanna compile my trade bef uh, before or after this trade and put them together and, as a bundle and I submit to the builder. And then the builder will be basically then sequencing the bundles um, and then the builder gonna submit to a relay uh, who doesn't, not supposed to touch the content or unbund unbundle it, but just like validating the syntax and everything. And then now there is another bidding layer for the validator who is basically used to be minor, but now after POS, it's proposer. Um, they are not supposed to uh, change the block content or whatever, but they are just like picking whatever the uh, block with highest value sending towards them. So this is like a, basically an implementation from Flashbots called MEV Boost, and which is a uh, sort of like implementation for the PBS uh, proposer builder separation. Um, so to make sure um, the proposer don't have too much power to decide everything and um, because now after POS, well, like proof of staking, um, the basically network power is in those who are staking ease. And so if you're a validator and you can accumulate more and more ease from the MEV you can attack, then the, uh, they can restake more and then it become very centralized. So that's, that's a big problem after POS and a lot of people are working on it. And so uh, echo back on the Dune topic here is that um, right now, because I MEU mean, Booster is a off-chain piece of um, infra, and so the data is like living in the um, different relays API. It's definitely accessible, um, but uh, we also seen all those like community uh, websites and, and charts, which are like really great. Called M you can check out like MEV Boost pic pictures, uh, relay scan. Um, but um, as Toby was saying, that like we want more normy people, right, to to query it, it's, or basically make it more. Um, accessible or easy to understand, and so more people can try to translate or interpret it. And that's the whole point about Dune. It's basically, um, I think, I think like transparency of blockchain is only guaranteed when people are able to like analyze the data and people are able to make sense of the data. So yeah, um, I go back on that. Um, um, okay, so here are my three slides. Um, so I, I want to like summarize what you can actually analyze on Dune. So I, I would say it's like a very interesting journey to see that like maybe starting from 2018 when I was just starting to uh, analyze like blockchain data, um, there wasn't much like interesting activity going on. Maybe there were like some NFT like crypto kitties or um, maybe one or two decks, but then um, it, most of the stats were much more boring, more like, hey, how is the uh, Ethereum network health look like? Um, so actually you can still do it right now today on Dune and there's a bunch of like really insightful charts uh, here and there. Um, looks a little bit out of the style, but I would just like, cool. Um, for example, um, 
the first one is the net uh, Ethereum emission by time from uh, Michael. So basically, after EIP 1559, um, all the e uh, ETH gas fee, um, part of it is base fee, which is going to be burned. And so this introduced a potential of like Ethereum supply or emission will be negative. Basically, it can become a deflationary assets. And so this chart is actually starting from like May 14th till today, and the, the timeline was a little bit hidden. Um, so, so yeah, like actually starting from there, if you look at the data, like Ethereum being deflate, uh, deflate, de deflationary every day. Um, well, we looked at further, uh, cross-checked with like ultrasound money. Um, it's, the data seems correct, and likely it's it's because of the meme coin um, case. You know, a lot of people are trading those meme coin and like burning their gas, which is great for our uh, you know economics of Ethereum, <laughs> right? And for example, like starting maybe from two years ago, there's different uh, L1, L2 coming up, like Optimism, um, Arbitron, um, Polygon, BSC, and people would start to wonder like how much assets are flowing into those um, layer one, layer two. Um, one way to look at it um, is the Ethereum bridging TVL. So basically, uh, there's a lot of bridge protocols where you can stake your assets in eth Ethereum and then basically withdraw it from another chain. And so one, one dashboard from Ilias is um, on the right upper side, uh, looking at like what's the TVL that's staked into all those bridge across different layer two. Um, apparently Polygon has the most asset right now, and then it's like um, Arbitron and Optimism. Um, there were some other layer one, layer two coming up, and then now it's kind of like died down. Um, the other charts down here is basically compare different networks cost of like basically making a trade. We kind of know, uh, I, I'm pretty sure everyone has the impression that like Ethereum is too expensive to use for a majority of the people. Um, it's usually, if we look at this chart, we can clearly have an understanding that you're gonna spend averagely like $7 for doing anything on Ethereum. Um, comparatively, um, Optimism and Optron are like much, much lower cost. Like one is 35 cents, another is like 10 cents. Um, and also Avalanche and BNB uh, also have like a 10 cents kind of cost. Um, so I, I think it gives us uh, or normal user a better, a better understanding of like which one is more you know, possible to use and which one is very costly. Um, so, so uh, okay, so I actually re arranged in another slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, right, okay, cool. <laughs> um, Right, so those are stats about like very basic or how to say low level like network health stats. Um, and I would say like go one level up to look at like a more higher level thing is, is that like uh, one very powerful thing is that you can look at the market state of our industry sector or like vertical or subdomain, right? Like so for example, um, we can look at the DEX aggregator market share um, since the beginning of um, when they come up. Um, the timeline is hidden, it's starting from like something like 2020. And you can pretty much see that like one inch started as a first one, and then there is Xerox API, Paraswap become pretty much the, the other two big uh, players. Um, as of today, it, one inch is still very dominant. Um, so, uh, but but it's it's good to see that the market getting you know more and more um, split it up, like uh, decentralized. There are more solutions for people to try it out, um, and it, yeah, it's very interesting for both of the projects to look at, like say, what's our market share? Um, usually you wouldn't get that data in like Tradify or anywhere else, because it's very, if the, yeah, your competitor is not a public company, it's very hard to find out the data about them, but everything on blockchain is indexable. Like, so any of you can basically figure out like what's the market share of say a uh, DEX or a DEX aggregator or like an NFT aggregator. Um, another example from Dolby is um, this interesting comparison actually of the uh, NFT, NFT market share um, in terms of volume and also trades. It's very interesting that we see the, the one on the left, which is blur, uh, they have like the gigantic volume share, which is like 60% of the market share. But then we look at the trades, then somehow it becomes, um, OpenSea becomes like slightly more dominant, which is like half of the market share. One thing you, you can tell is that basically, apparently like blur trades are much higher volume or basically maybe um, they're, they're uh, having a lot of maybe blue chip trades right now is happening on blur. you know. Um, if you can maybe have another look on the trader spill it, that would be also interesting um, to bring different perspectives. Um, uh, projects look at it, and also investors in the crypto uh, space also look at all these on-chain on data for uh, due diligence. I guess that's why they hired Dolby, right, for, for a VC. Um, yeah, uh, besides uh, market share, projects, health, and like network, you can also analyze the user base of project. Um, one chart here it might be slightly small, is basically looking at the, how the user segmentation of Uniswap uh, look like, both on V2 and V3. Um, I'll explain it slightly. Um, 
in detail. So the new means like uh, this month, how many new wallets we see made made a trade on Uniswap that's that's never active on Uniswap in the past. So meaning uh, we kind of define it as a new wallet. Um, and then retain it means this wallet was trading last month and also trading this month. And then um, churn means uh, this wallet was trading last month but not trading this month. And then return means this wallet traded before but not trading last month but trading this month. Um, so basically, New and retain and re return together basically is like monthly active user um, or wallets to be accurate. And then churn is like churn user. Um, so it's very interesting to see like um, the, uh, you can analyze, apply this, um, you can copy paste this query and just like change how you define user into any projects and to understand like how's the user distribution look like, how's the user growth look like. Maybe um, a project in crypt like cr crypto project, they did like a huge campaign. They're like compensating people to, hey, come trade. But then people are gonna be, you, you're gonna see like a huge spike of new, and then next week like a huge spike of churn. And then um, maybe um, if the retain will be pretty small because a lot of people maybe just like hunting and or like farming a little bit of incentive. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a good way to analyze um, your uh, marketing campaign you were, um, or basically user growth. Um, another uh, maybe further uh, metrics you can develop on top of is like, so if you are working in a pro product team, your uh, growth manager will be like, hey, we want to design this campaign, um, but I don't know how much budget we can put on it. Can you help me to maybe define lifetime user value? Um, and then so we know how much, um, how many users we may be able to convert, and then on top of that, how much lifetime value those users will bring. And with that, you can probably tie this number of user kind of data to maybe how your project is making revenue. So basically, if one user bringing in like 10 cents revenue, then from there you can define how much budget you can cost for you know, all those uh, growth campaign, all that. Um, another chart interesting here is that um, it's similar, basically. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's a similar one, this looking at new user growth. Um, yeah, I just wanna show uh, all kinds of data you can analyze, and uh, thanks for listening and coming, everyone.